one of the most basic concepts in, the, in nonproliferation is the nuclear fuel cycle that it, and it, I'm going to spend today and next week and, and, and additional weeks covering uh, either the fuel cycle itself or parts of the fuel cycle. And this diagram, which is from the ISIS website, um, it's a little hard to see from your chair, but I'll go through it. It, it shows the steps necessary um, the, if you want to produce nuclear explosive materials or produce low enriched uranium for a nuclear power reactor or produce plutonium as a byproduct where you don't intend to, to misuse it. But the, the first step is always the, getting uranium. And traditionally, it's, it's extracted from the ground. <clears throat> There's various ways to do it. Sometimes there are deep mines. Sometimes it's like strip mining. Um, it comes out in very low concentrations. If it's an ore, it may only, only 1% of the ore um, may be uranium. Um, another thing is uranium is everywhere. The, you could extract it from seawater if you wanted, but it's just not economical. And so you, a lot of the art of uranium mining is to find the places where the concentrations of uranium are high enough to make a profit, essentially, or to bear the cost if you're a nuclear weapons state like Russia. Um, the, in the, in, particularly in the early days, they still they had to find it and pay for it. Um, once you take it from the ground, then you have to concentrate it. So you, if it's an ore, you have to be able to crush it and extract the uranium. And it comes out in a form that's called yellow cake, and which is just a, it's yellow. It's just a yellow powder. Um, the, after it's been it's milled and you have the yellow cake, it's typically sent to a, a plant where it's called conversion facility. And what that is doing is it's chemically changing its form. So yellow cake, for you, those of you who are chemists, it's U308 typically. And, and it's not very pure. And so a conversion facility um, is charged with purifying it. And then typically it'll, it'll turn it into a uranium dioxide, UO2, but a very pure form of that. And then, and then what happens after that just depends on, on what part of the fuel cycle that it, it's destined for. So if it's going to go to enrichment, um, which is number three, it's going to have to be turned into a form that that enrichment process can use. So it, it, if it's a gas centrifuge or gaseous diffusion, uh, things we'll cover, it would be turned into uranium hexafluoride. And so the, there's a chemical process to go from uranium dioxide to, ur to uranium hexafluoride. I'll give an example a little later on of where you, you actually use the, the natural uranium as fuel in a reactor. You don't enrich it. Um, but in this, following this figure, after the uranium is enriched, you then have to turn it into fuel, which involves other conversion processes to get to change it from uranium hexafluoride back to the form you want for the fuel. In this case, where it's a Iranian fuel cycle involving light water reactor, um, it would be turned back into oxide, and then it, it's prepared into a ceramic, and then turned into fuel rods and then fuel assemblies in preparation for insertion in the reactor. After it's in the reactor for some amount of time, um, a lot of the uranium-235 would have fissioned, and it would become essentially spent. And, and, and one of the terms for the fuel when it comes out is spent fuel. It's also just called irradiated fuel. And at that point, there's two decisions to be, or two possibilities that, are, that typically are made. One is it's just put into storage. And, and, and they're not reused in any manner. Um, and so the United States does that at its light water reactors, these big power reactors, the fuel comes out and simply goes into storage. In other countries, um, it, it could be re what's called reprocessed, where the idea is to take out the plutonium and residual, in this case, enriched uranium, and then reuse those again. And so the, the plutonium um, 
would be separated again through a chemical process. This time it's a very specialized facility because the material is so radioactive. The spent fuel is so radioactive. You have to have all kinds of um, special arrangements made for protecting the workers. They're done in, in typically concrete buildings with thick walls, lead, lead, leaded glass, and, and a lot of remote manipulation. Um, or automatic operations, so you, you don't you keep people away from from what's going on, um, and what you end up with is a, a separated plutonium, which is a, a nuclear explosive material in the sense that you could use that um, to make a bomb. You may you may if it comes out as oxide, you may need to convert it into a metal, um, but it, even oxide in in some theory theoretical constructs could be used to make a nuclear explosive. Now the other output of, of a processing plant is high level waste and, and there's a lot of it and that has to also be disposed of somehow. So this would be a, a fuel cycle that is really intended to be for civil purposes but you worry that, it, that the plutonium in this case could be diverted. Um, you also, if you're working on safeguards, you have to worry that a diversion could happen at the enrichment plant that the plant that's supposedly making low enriched uranium for reactor could actually be misused to make high enriched uranium for nuclear weapons. Or the low enriched uranium could be diverted for a covert enrichment plant that would take it from low enriched uranium up to weapon grade. And so there's, there's, these are the diversion points principally. Um, there's also a diversion point at number five where if you, if you were able to steal away some spent fuel or divert spent fuel, you could have a secret reprocessing plant um, that would, would, could be a very crude one that would then separate the plutonium. So while this is civil, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency has to worry a great deal that it, uh, about potential diversion. Now here's um, a nuclear weapon fuel cycle, and, it, and it's, it's considerably um, different in terms of this, in terms of the end steps, the beginning steps are very similar. You start with the uranium mine or and mill to get the natural uranium. You then convert it at a conversion facility to turn it into the kind of material you need, and and it and at that point it splits. Um, are you going to make weapon grade uranium or high enriched uranium for nuclear weapons? Well, then you need it in this form of uranium hexafluoride, and and it would go to an enrichment plant. And then the, after enrichment, um, the weapon grade uranium would have to be converted from fluoride to essentially the metal and then for use in a nuclear weapon. Um, on the plutonium production side, and I, I want, and I want to go through an example of this today, on the con you'll, you'll need to turn it into fuel. And then you need a reactor. In this case, it's a heavy water reactor, which we'll talk about more next week. Um, and then you'd have a reprocessing step after the fuel's been in there for a, a length of time. And then the separated plutonium coming out of the reprocessing plant would then be turned into to metal for use in a nuclear weapon. Are there any questions on this? And again, I know this is a little complicated if you've never heard this before. Um, and, and, but I need you to, to kind of just become familiar with, with the, the words involved in this and that and that and that it's a process and it's this process whether it's the civil side or the weapon side is actually quite complicated to do it's not an easy easy thing to master and because of the complexity of the fuel cycle it's um, it's one of the reasons why there isn't a lot of proliferation. If everyone could get plutonium in metal form or highly enriched uranium in metal form, there'd be a lot more bombs out there. The weaponization part in general is much simpler than the process of putting together a fuel cycle to make plutonium or highly enriched uranium. The, the, the main thing I want to do today is go through an example of a fuel cycle that, that is um, of internet, actually of international concern, and it's this, this small Yongbyon reactor in North Korea, and um, and it's been in the news recently, even where has it first did it restart, which now everyone agrees it did after several years of being shut down, um, and then there's questions of has it temporarily 
stopped. And that always raises uh, issues, which I'll talk about, of whether fuel is being discharged so plutonium could be separated from the spent fuel. And so we're monitoring it pretty carefully with satellite imagery. And there's studies on our website um, that we've put up over the last month on this. And it also, I mean, if you look at the news, um, we, for example, did this study where after a month of looking, we think something, it, it shut down. And it um, doesn't mean it's closed, but just shut down. South Korean government <coughs> didn't like that answer and has tried to contest it. Um, but so far, they, they haven't presented us any evidence and, and have actually said in private that it, that it, we don't want people to think that it's shut down like it's gone away, that it, it could restart. And that, um, and so from a political point of view, our study is a little ill-timed. And they, and they want everyone to think of this reactor as operational and, a, and as a threat. And, it's a, and it is, and we, we, we agree uh, that it hasn't been shut down. Um, but we don't see evidence that it's, it's operational. So anyway, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, but the reactor's been there a long time. It started operation in 86. It was detected by intelligence agencies, and there were leaks to the press a year or two before that. And so people knew this was coming. Um, when it was revealed officially, North Korea said it was for civilian purposes, which absolutely no one believed. And, um, but they stuck to that story for years. They then, under pressure from Russia, signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but didn't allow the international inspectors in to start the inspection until 1992. It was uh, seven years of waiting. Um, as the inspectors learned more from the North Koreans, uh, North Korean said it had a, a nominal power of 25 megawatts thermal. Um, and at the time, North Korea discussed the reactor in terms of its output of electricity, namely 5 megawatts electric. And these terms are, <coughs> I understand they're new to you, but megawatt electric um, or electrical is just a term that refers to the electric, electrical power output, and which is for a civilian reactor typically is the meaningful fact, is the meaningful number. How much electricity does it produce? And different reactors have different efficiencies. And so the, you can, the total power that's generated can be three to five times greater. And you, it's just a, a fact of life that you can't harness 100% of the energy that comes off of, of something. Um, and in fact, this, this Five megawatt electric says right off that the 25 is too high. It's probably more like 20. I mean, it, 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 a maximum of 25, but it's, it already raises questions about that number. Um, and there's also, when the IA got in there, um, the North Koreans um, falsified their declarations, as it turned out later. And there were a lot of disputes over how much plutonium the reactor had made and where, it, where did that plutonium end up. Um, and the, I won't go into the history, but there, there was a, a, an agreement reached that kind of froze activities there. 10 years later, or less than 10 years, the agreement unwound. And at that point in time, when it unwound in 2002, North Korea said, yeah, this is a reactor to make plutonium for nuclear weapons. And that's what they started to do, um, was just run it exclusively to make nuclear weapons. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, no. Um, I, in the, it was in the book, and it's here, when, you're, when you say that the North Korea discusses the reactor in terms of five megawatts electrical. Is that just to minimize? They were trying to say that's right. five sounds better than twenty-five. Well, five electric implies that it's civilian; that yeah. it's there to make it's there to make electricity, not not to make yeah. plutonium for nuclear weapons. I also said something incorrect. The five megawatt corresponds to the twenty-five for this type of reactor. It's about five, five times greater. Now. 
this reactor's fuel cycle um, so it involves uranium mined in mills, out, and, the, and they're outside of Yongbyon, and of course they produce natural uranium. Um, there's a fuel fabrication complex. In fact, let me just show you a picture. This is an, an old satellite image from 1989. It was one of the very first ones we could ever purchase commercially, and it, it was a Russian image. And it shows the locations of, of the five megawatt electric reactor. Um, let me, as background, show you. Here's a, it's even a better picture. This is, the site is, if you look for it in Google Earth, it's very distinctive because of the shape of this river, the Kiryong River, that wraps around it. And um, the, and that's, uh, well, that's north-south picture of it with the river. And then if I go back up with this not so great image, um, you can see where the, the five megawatt electric reactor is. The fuel fabrication area is down in the south. Um, the radio, they call the North Koreans call it a radiochemical laboratory, which is where they separate plutonium. And, and then the um, plutonium metal is also made there. But they, um, stripped out that part of the facility when the when the IE came along. Again, to, if you see a metal fabrication line for plutonium or even highly enriched uranium, you immediately start thinking of nuclear weapons. It's not typically the material used in a civil fuel cycle. And here's a ground image of the reactor. It has a very distinctive shape. It's not the kind of shape you're used to if you look at nuclear power plants in this country. <clears throat> where they have domes, but this is a this is a for this type of reactor. It's called a gas graphite reactor. It's an old design. This is very typical looking building. And the main thing to notice is is a very tall building. Um, it has a stack, and then and then it, it in this case it has a cooling tower. And often cooling towers associated with nuclear reactors, but that's not. But many other things have cooling towers. Coal plant could. Uh, it's just a device to dissipate the excess heat. And so, but these combined, these, these indicators combined are, are a pretty clear indication of a reactor. And, it, and it, there was a, North Korea was the kind of, I don't mean contractor for Syria's purchase of a reactor. Um, and one of the things they did right away was get rid of the hype by putting a lot of it underground. They then just put um, building or walls, fake walls, around the, the outer perimeter to hide this internal structure. So the and they and they fooled the world for quite a while. In 2008, under an uh, agreement that again had frozen North Korea's plutonium production complex at Yongbyon. North Korea took some steps to, this, in this case it was mostly symbolic, but it, but it, um, it turned out to, to be a step that was hard to reverse. Um, they blew up their cooling tower. And other steps they'd taken, they were called disablement steps to try to make it harder to restart the facilities involved in the plutonium production and separation. A lot of those were very easy to reverse. It turned out it took North Korea longer to reverse these, the steps of, of putting together um, a cooling system for the reactor. And before I talk about that, I, just some background on the reactor. It's, it's as I mentioned, it's an, it's an old design. I hope I mentioned that. And it was a design developed by the British and the French in the 50s, and, and most of the design information is long ago declassified, and it's fairly simple to, to copy and, and fairly straightforward to, to scale up. But even with that, it was necessary for North Korea to buy many things abroad. It couldn't make all the, all the equipment that goes into this plant, and still can't. So it still goes out and buys internationally for um, <coughs> certain things, pumps, um, even turbines uh, they buy. And, and this reactor is um, moderated by graphite. 
and there's 300 tons of graphite are used in the core. So it's a, it's a huge amount. And again, this is um, a reactor that, that um, requires cooling in the primary cooling circuit, and, and the carbon dioxide is used for that. So that's the gas, and so the, there's something called blowers that push the gas through the reactor. Um, and the carbon dioxide, is, in, in turn, it goes through a heat exchanger that, where water cools the, the gas. And the water would, in the old way, would go out and go up to the cooling tower and essentially be dropped down through it. And, the, and as it streams down, it gets cooled, it pools in the bottom, and it's recycled back. And so you have a circuit that'll, that'll cool the reactor. Now, this, as I said, it's a very old reactor, and they have to replace these various pumps. So for example, no, there's, these reactors don't, there's very few of them left in the world. So if they want to buy pumps for pumping the carbon dioxide, it's actually complicated to get since they don't make them for these reactors anymore. So they have to go, they went out and when they needed to replace them in the five megawatt, they had to go out and buy, buy these pumps that actually use for other purposes, but could be adapted to use with CO2. And here's a schematic of this kind of reactor. And what I've been talking about is the heat exchanger, the carbon dioxide goes through the reactor and it's, it's pumped, and then there's some kind of exchanger where the, the water is heated by the gas, and, that, and, and you can produce steam that way. And then you can use the steam to drive a turbine to make electricity, which is the five megawatt electric part, and then the rest of the, um, well, the water at that point after the turbine, heated water then goes and, and is run through the cooling tower and it's cooled, and it's a closed circuit. And in this case, I, I'm trying to just introduce these ideas. Again, it's, it's this is a, the nature of this course, I have to throw a lot of terms at you. And, and we'll come back and cover this in more detail next time. But, but the, the main thing to know here is that, think of it, it's called a gas graphite reactor. And, it's, and the graphite refers to the material that is, moderates the neutrons, slows them down so they can then fission the uranium-235. So again, it's, um, I know it's a lot. And, but I'm also mentioning these things because the part of the counterproliferation is to try to keep countries like North Korea from succeeding buying these things. If they have to go out and buy pumps, I mean, we know recently they went out and had to buy water pumps. Um, for the secondary cooling system. After they had to rebuild the secondary cooling system, and so they went out and bought new pumps, actually made in Europe, but the European company thought they were selling them to a Chinese company, but in fact that Chinese company was being taken by another Chinese company or a North Korean entity, and, this, and the material was diverted to, to North Korea. And so if you, you can determine these things before they, they happen, you can, you can move to stop them. And so the, the I, part of the way I, why I want to introduce these goods so you, so as part of a discussion on, that we'll have later on counterproliferation or you'll have later in your jobs. But it's a very important part of, of, um, of counterproliferation efforts because the f fuel cycle requires facilities that are hard to build and, and have components that, that, and goods that many countries cannot make, that are, particularly that are adversaries of the United States. Here's an overhead of, of, the, of the Yongbyon reactor. And, and, and I, hope we, I hope that after you've taken this course that, that you can have a better handle on satellite imagery. And so this is a more recent one where the cooling tower is, um, is gone. See where, well, it's, it was down in this area. Here, here's the reactor. So it's a little bit of an art to learn how to look at things from above, but it's, 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 it, people manage it all the time with some practice. Um, I won't get into this, but North Korea's building another reactor just south of the five megawatt. But here's what they did on the outflow. They basically um, replaced the cooling tower where they just 
they, they discharge the water here into the, into the river. And, and I think people in 2008, when they blew up this cooling tower, never thought North Korea would do something so simple. That it's, it, it's not a very big river, probably a lot of fish die, and, um, but environmental standards have never been one of North Korea's priority. And, and reactor safety doesn't appear to be, because when they're buying things like these pumps <coughs> for pushing the gas through, pumping the water in the secondary circuit, um, they had to buy a turbine overseas for this new reactor. None of it's nuclear certified. The nuclear certified equipment goes through special um, procedures and manufacturing methods to ensure it doesn't fail. Because um, you, you, as you would, as you know, you worry a great deal about accidents, and so you want the the best quality equipment, and you want to make sure it's gone through some kind of process um, that it is the best quality. And North Korea just can't can't uh, doesn't worry about that. So so killing a lot of fish wouldn't, wouldn't wasn't their concern. And in fact, partly why we thought the reactor has shut down is, is that you can't run this thing without getting rid of the heat produced by the reactor. And so if the water isn't coming out that pipe, and it, we looked at it for a month, and, and there hasn't been any outflow. So it, it raised the question of whether it sh it's shut down temporarily. And we couldn't find any other outflow. That They could have replaced this with another one, but we couldn't find that. And here's an overhead image of the reactor. And this one in the satellite image, you can, you can see the cooling tower, you can see the tall stack, and then you can see how high the building is. It's slight, this is slightly off, off of straight up above the uh, building, and so you can see that it's a tall building. Now let me go to the, the front part of the fuel cycle, or the, what's typically called the front end. I mentioned this earlier that they, they, North Koreans extract the uranium from, from mines. Um, they have, they've had several mines over the years. They're, they have mills to concentrate the uranium. And in this case, each ton of ore is estimated to contain about one kilogram of uranium. And then, and again, I, I've talked about the, the U-308. And in this case, the yellow cake is shipped to the fuel fabrication complex at the Yongbyon site, which is, this is what it looks like. It's a, it's a, again, pretty large industrial infrastructure. A lot of things going on. It's, it looks kind of run down, which is often what you see in North Korea. Um, but many buildings are involved in the process of, of actually turning the yellow cake into a form that can be used in the five megawatt electric reactor. That you have to make the UO2. Um, it has to be processed into uranium tetrafluoride. Um, and, the, and what you do once you have the uranium tetrafluoride is you, you combine it with some an, oh, an element. It could be magnesium. You put it in kind of a reactor and you heat it, and there's a very energetic reaction. And you end up with, with uranium metal, the bottom of this thing, and then um, some junk at the top. And the, this facility has has quite a few, um, quite a, a capability to make a lot of it because the five megawatt electric reactor was going to be just the start of the of, of their reactor program. Does everyone know what the agreed framework is? Have you all heard of that? Anyone who hasn't? I mean, one of the things people badmouth it quite often, particularly Republicans, but one of the true successes of the, of the agreed framework is that it stopped the de North Korea building two other reactors that were much larger and could have produced huge amounts of plutonium for nuclear weapons. <clears throat> and so the lasting benefit of the agreed framework is all they've got is this, is this five megawatt electric reactor. And there's a kind of an old decaying um, shell of a 50, 50 megawatt electric reactor, which you'll see in this film, but that was never finished. Now, once you have it in metal form, um, you basically just kind of push it and stretch it into uranium 
metal rods. And, um, and they're, each one is about 60 centimeters in length. And this is uh, actually from the video, just a, a stack of them. Nothing, they, they don't look that fancy. And, and this is not highly sophisticated nuclear science involved in this or engineering. This is, again, it's a very old method. Um, and once, you're, um, once you have the rods, then you clad uh, what they t call it. It's really just inserting the rods into a magnesium alloy tube and then seal it. And, and, he, and today, to this date, um, North Korea doesn't make the magnesium alloy, alloy. It actually buys it illegally. Uh, it buys it as a powder in China. It's, and there's only one company in the, in the world still making it. It's a British company because they still have some of these gas graphite reactors that use this kind of cladding. And, um, and North Korea manages to get it illegally. Now the core of the reactor, it has a lot of this. This is a particular feature of this kind of reactor that it has 50 tons of natural uranium and about 8,000 fuel rods. <clears throat> and each rod weighs 6.2 kilograms. So you're going to have a, a, lot of, a lot of fuel to move in and out of the reactor. And there's more on the dimensions of this, more on the technical aspects of this in the Solving the North Korea book. And here's a picture of the core. Um, I think this picture is from, must be from 2008 when, the, when they blew up the cooling tower and they invited the press there. Now, on the reactor, what that big thing is, it's, uh, you can see, well, sorry, the, the yellow is, 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 where, is, a, is a kind of a shield above the reactor itself. And the, and the black things are, are over um, what amount to 800 vertical channels or tubes in which the fuel is placed. And each channel can contain up to about 10 fuel rods. You also know this is for the, normally the North Koreans do not dress up like that. They, they, you'll see them in the movie, they don't wear much protective clothing at all. When the agreement, it's called the Six Party Talks Agreement to, to shut down Yongbyon or freeze it, with the US people came in to help with this disable, disabling of these facilities. And the US people showed up with all kinds of protective gear. And at that point, the North Koreans said, well, you know, we want some too. And, uh, so just the, <clears throat> it made the workers at least question whether they were getting the full protection. You know, the re after the fuel is irradiated, and it can take, it can be in the reactor for a few years to up to six years, depends on what they're trying to do. Um, you then, they then pull out the entire core and replace all 8,000 fuel rods. And they transfer the, the fuel through a tunnel done remotely that is adjacent building where there's this this pond and the, and the fuel rods are left in there um, until they we call it in the business cool sufficiently um, and what that amounts to is is that the fuel rods are just filled with radioactive material but a lot of that material has a relatively short half-life um, and so if you wait a few months a lot of it will be gone, and then, and then if you want to send it to a reprocessing plant, the risk to the workers is much less, and the shielding requirements are much less, and the emissions of radioactive materials are much less. Um, you know, in our program in the 40s, they, they wanted to run um, fuel, spend fuel through the reprocessing plant quickly, and they, they called it a green run, and it had a lot of radioactive iodine, which has a half-life of eight days. And so instead of letting all that dissipate or decay away, they, they ran it through when there was a lot of radioactive iodine, and it all went out the stack and um, caused quite a huge radiation problem um, in, the, in the Hanford area. But that, that taught people that, that you really you want to let this stuff cool for a while. Once they're cooled, the rods are cooled sufficiently, 
the, they're sent over to the radiochemical laboratory, which is, is a very large complex. Um, and it just, they go there by special containers by truck. I mean, you never, with satellite imagery, you, we, we know what the truck looks like, but we've never seen one. I mean, they, we think they do it principally at night. And all these places have bays where they can, you know, the truck drives in, picks up its, its, the containers with the spent fuel. They drive to here where they can go into a bay. And so unless you see it in motion, you're not going to see it. Uh, but we've never been able to see it. And the place where the processing takes place is in that long building where the blue arrow points to it. And it's uh, about 200 meters long with a lot of, inside is a lot of concrete structures where the, the actual chemical processes take place. Now the final step is, is separated plutonium and it typically will come out as a nitrate or an oxide. <clears throat> and, and in the North Korean case, the final step it'll be a plutonium oxide. And when the inspectors showed up in 92, that's all they saw were cap the facilities or capabilities to make plutonium oxide, but not plutonium metal. But in part of the room, had, there clearly there was evidence that something had been removed. And so it was one of the questions the IA had, well, what was there? North Korea said nothing of consequence, but it did turn out that it was the, appears to have been the, cap the facility or the equipment to make, turn the plutonium oxide into metal. But again, as part of their story that it's only civilian, they wanted to say that the end, end product was oxide. Well, this is just to remind you of, what, of what's, what's happened. Um, are there any questions on this? Yeah. What happens to the uh, water in the spent fuel pond? Well, there'll be, in the, we'll go through this video. Okay. It's, it's um, this kind of fuel cladding isn't stable in water, it corrodes. And so you, you have to, if you want to kind of lessen the corrosion, you want really pure water, certain chemistry, uh, you want to cool. <clears throat> and North Korea did nothing. And um, you'll see in this video how it looked like when the inspector showed up. Um, this image, which I showed earlier, um, this was actually um, during the days of the agreed framework. When the U.S. came in to help them, they called it can the fuel, try to keep the fuel from corroding and, and be kept safe for as long for years and years and years, and that that's the the kind of a cleaned up spent fuel pond. Um, the water is radioactive. Right? Well, it, it leaks. The, the the radioactive material in the in the fuel rods can leak because they can crack, and and um, and and yes, the water can become quite dangerous to be near. I mean, it's, um, it shouldn't if you, and, and, it, and in most cases, um, in this case where they were canning it, it was, it was perfectly fine because the, the fuel rods are put inside a larger container and then that container is sealed and so it doesn't leak. When they just put in fuel rods in, in, like, in little baskets, um, if, they're, if they're removing them after a couple of months, typically they're not going to leak. But if they leave them in there for, you know, a year or two years, you could have tremendous corrosion and leakage if you're not taking care of the water. Do you want to switch over to the video? Thanks. And let me just say a few things about this. The, the IA went in in 1992 for the first time <coughs> to see the, the, the entire fuel cycle of North Korea. And uh, typically when that happens, you know, the IA sends the director general at that time, it was Hans Blix, um, and, and, they, and an important delegation accompanies him, and then the North Koreans have their own delegations. And in this case, the North Koreans filmed everything and gave a copy to the IA. And so this is a, um, a video highlighting, um, or with highlights from their visit. And so again, it's not the best quality, it's aged, I mean, we got this, back in 1992 or 93. And, um, 
and so we 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 didn't digitize it right away. So the video aged, and uh, but anyway, this starts uh, about a minute or two into it. The full video is on our website. But I, but why don't you start, Dan, and, and but stay there because I may want to stop it. Oh. Yeah, and that's Hans Blix in the background. Unfortunately, we never could make out these pictures or the, the, the schematics. Yeah, and I apologize for the audio, but here anyway. So here's the five megawatt. Yeah, they called it an experimental nuclear power. The design of the five megawatt pilot power reactor was presented. It is gas cooled, graphite moderated, with natural uranium fuel. This is the control room. And here is the top of the core and the core loading equipment above the fuel channel. Yeah, and that's the fuel unloading machine or loading machine, and that's the <coughs> operator who, who that, and he's looking into the fuel channel as he loads the fuel. Or to Here we see a turbine. And the electric generator. Generator. And here's how it was back then. I don't, do they show it? I think they do. So it's kind of green, and God knows what's in it. The fuel element transfer equipment above it. And at the time, there wasn't much fuel in it. I mean, if any, actually. Yeah, and this is the one. It was a much bigger one. It was under construction. <coughs> And the North Korean technical people are actually quite open. I mean, if you engage in a technical discussion, they're they're quite quite easy to talk to. And oh, and here's the radiochemical laboratory. And what that means, that's where the product, the plutonium oxide, was 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 uh, separated. <coughs> Can you turn it off for a second? Because uh, one of them, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, on detecting these sites, but it, it, this building, the construction started at around maybe 80, I don't know, 84 to 86. But you, you see a lot of things being built in, in, in Young Beyond. You don't know what they are. And um, the reactor had been identified quite early during the construction phase. Um, but there, it wasn't clear what this building was, and and I don't think they show pictures here. But in satellite imagery, you can see it it's it has windows on the outside, and um, and if you look at the processing plants, and, and hopefully we'll have a module on that, they look like just big concrete buildings, huge, and and you would never expect a window. Um, and so many didn't think it was, was a reprocessing plant. And uh, one person at Savannah River, um, where that was one of our weapons production sites where they made plutonium and tritium for nuclear weapons, they were reprocessing plants. He, he had retired and, um, 
and was working on the intelligence side, and, and, and he, he analyzed the images of the building. And, and when he looked inside it, the roof wasn't on, he, he felt he saw concrete structures, or the, essentially the canyon inside this building. And, and he went out in, in about 88, 89 with his conclusions. And it was completely unwelcome. It was the, by the US government. The, there had been a war, the, an idea that things with North Korea could be solved. And, and the State Department in particularly, uh, particularly felt it was not a reprocessing plan. And they actually contracted with a, a, a national lab, Livermore, which did a study which came back and said it's a, God, what is that? Black graphite? Uh, I'm forgetting what it is. I don't know why. But it, uh, an industrial facility, nothing to do with plutonium separation. This visit by Blix solidified that it truly was a reprocessing plant, albeit an odd one, that, that you would have windows on the outside and have the concrete structures inside and have it built in floors too. So that in this, they're on the third floor um, and all the very, the most radioactive materials are, are below them, which, you know, for example, if there's a breach, I mean, you wouldn't want to be above it. So if somehow the concrete structures Somehow there's an explosion or something. It's it's odd to have a lot of stuff, um, or it's it's it, it's questionable from a safety point of view to put a lot of p things that are where people are walking around um, like this above um, so or the, the the canyon. Anyway, go ahead. But again, I, I mentioned that it's just uh, intelligence misuse has has been going on a long time. fabrication plant, a further presentation was made. In the foreground, we see a uranium ingot. The fuel fabrication plant was then visited in detail. The other thing, fuel, this fuel cycle, it's a, it's, it's a very kind of, I wouldn't say dirty, but just it's a very, it's very industrial. I mean, I, I, a lot of people think it's high tech, you know, like working at NASA, but it's, this isn't that far off from what it looks like in U.S. facilities of that time period or earlier. Oh, they went into an underground. Yeah, I missed, you know, Dan, I, I shouldn't have talked. They went into, there, it turns out they had a tunnel complex near near the, um, or at the Young Beyond site. But yeah, it, so they, they were, they're down in that now, so deeply buried. At the time of the group's visit, the rooms that were seen were empty. Several other installations at Yongbyon were visited before the return to Pyongyang.
if my memory serves me right, when they started secret learning how to separate plutonium, they did it in that building. Again, they, it was back in the 80s. It was they never declared it to the IA, but they <coughs> they um, secretly produced small amounts of separated plutonium. This, this music is playing at the site, so the, I'm sure they don't do that every day. This is the steel lattice work for the pre stressed concrete. This would be a uranium mill. they returned to Pyongyang. There they saw a fresh fuel assembly. Yeah, those were fuel lines, but a different, there. different reactor. And further fresh fuel elements. This is the parliament building in Pyongyang, where the group was received by the prime minister, Mr. Yong Kyung Muk. Do you want to see this? I don't know. It's just a little hard to understand, but it's the formalities of international nuclear diplomacy. You know, now they exchange the documents that have to do with safeguards. And A 
upon completion of the visit, a final view of the city of Pyongyang. Is that you're able to calculate plutonium production. It's a very simple formula. Um, but I think you should have some, just do some calculations in this course. But what I'll, what I'll try to do or finish up with is just some more discussion of plutonium production, a little more technical level. Um, I mentioned that the plutonium is produced rather slowly in the five megawatt electric, so the fuel sits in there a pretty long period of time. Um, and that means that in total, North Korea hasn't gotten a lot of plutonium from this reactor, relatively speaking. I mean, it's, um, it's current, at, well, let's say of last, well, its current at, at inventory is about 30 to 34 kilograms of separated plutonium. It had more, um, but it's used up some of it in tests, underground tests. It had three. Um, there's a discrepancy of whether they have up to, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, ten kilograms more. That was the discrepancy that the IA found in their initial declarations in 92 and 93. Uh, and, um, but they, uh, since that time, no one's come up with any conclusive evidence that this other ten, up to ten kilograms exists. Um, now, one of the issues is how much plutonium is used in each nuclear weapon in, in North Korea or test device. And the only data is that North Korea said that the 2006 test had two kilograms in it, and that, which is a very small amount. So and if it's two kilograms, then they have enough. Uh, if you take the upper bound of 34 kilograms, they have enough for 17 nuclear weapons. <clears throat> if you use a more standard number of five kilograms of plutonium per weapon, um, then, you, then they only have enough for six. And, and, and this is unfortunately um, where things are. I mean, it's very difficult to figure out um, how many nuclear weapons North Korea could have made out of plutonium. And, and there's no, I, I, there's only speculation. A lot, most people don't believe they can use just two. Um, but you can't completely dismiss it because they could have had significant amounts of help um, from the Chinese back in the 70s and early 80s, when China believed in nuclear proliferation, that was its policy, um, and and they could have had help via the Khan network in the in the 1990s. So they they could have had a been working with a pretty advanced nuclear weapon design when they finally decided to build nuclear weapons in the 2000s. So you, it's you can't dismiss the two. At the same way, you probably don't believe the five. The five the, is a lot, and you can you can certainly do better than that. So it's it's um, you, but it's a debate, and um, and you'll see it acted out in the press. Do they have four or five? Do they have a lot more? Um, and the, there's I mentioned this idea that intelligence is often misused by policymakers. Um, if you look at countries and you and you look at do, are they scared of public discussions of North Korean nuclear weapons and advancements, <coughs> particularly advancements, you'll see in those countries that the intelligence agencies tend to pick a number at the high end. I mean, I, South Korea is a perfect example. They, for years, insisted that it had to be six. And, and Trinity had six, as I think I mentioned that. So they said it, they have to, they can't do any better than what the U.S. did on its first, first device, and and therefore it's six. And whenever they made their calculations, and and then had either public statements or leaks, the number of weapons was determined by that. And um, they also don't believe that um, North Korea can weaponize to the point of putting it on a, on an, on one of their missiles. Here in the intelligence community, in the lower levels, the miniaturization question was, they gave them credit for it years ago that they can do it. Here, the top leadership isn't the most comfortable with that. And, there, and a couple years ago, there was some, some debate um, challenging that view. Um, but in our interactions with, with um, people inside the intelligence community, that's that, the miniaturization issue. Hasn't been a hasn't been an issue for a long time, at least for their for some of their 
um, shorter range missiles like the Nodong. But again, the politics is really can stir this up and, um, and shade how people, how people talk about this. So in this case, I guess the lesson is, is that just, just think of the whole range. And, and, in, and if you hear statements in the media or um, in a debate that, it, that ask, them what, ask them what they think is the plutonium per weapon. But I just want to use it to illustrate um, the idea of, of burn up or radiation in the reactor. If you leave the fuel in longer, how much plutonium builds up over time. And that's this line here is the, is, is shows the amount of plutonium. And this starts with <coughs> um, the reactor starting in January of 1986. And the fuel, in this case, um, it's left in there until 1994, April of 1994. So it's left in there for eight years. And you can see that the plutonium builds up fairly slowly. And this is the amount of plutonium. In this case, it's grams per ton of uranium. So if you wanted to know the amount in the, in the whole core, you'd multiply it by 50. So um, if it's, what is 6, 10 times? So in April 94, that would be 30 kilograms, 30.5 kilograms of total plutonium. We're down here in, in 1989. It would be nine, about 9.3 kilograms. So there's quite a difference in the buildup in the plutonium. Um, but again, this, this shows that it's going to build up. And the grade of the plutonium is going to change. This is, is very much weapon grade plutonium. Remember, if it's anything over uh, with essentially over 93% plutonium-239. And it's measured, if you remember, by how much plutonium-240. So it's less than 7% plutonium-240. Um, as you get up here, this is still weapon grade. But here, this, is, this would be fuel grade. Be about, I don't know what it is, 90. Someone can do the math. So it's this number, this number divided by this number. And, and so if, and this is, the, this is the North Korean declaration to the IA. They started in 86. <coughs> they let the plutonium build up, and they didn't take the fuel out until 94. And some of that over, in a sense, it's over radiated, but it was due to the fact that there was a huge controversy and conflict in 93 and 94, where North Korea was told if you take the fuel out, <coughs> it could be war, essentially, or there'd be a major, major consequences. Finally, in 94, they decided to take it out anyway. And, uh, and there was a crisis <coughs> that led to, that was settled actually and led to the agreed framework. Um, what the IA wonders about and what the US has argued is that the fuel stayed in here and was taken out in 1989. And then a new core was put in. And that is what led over time to this amount. So you had a, essentially, it wasn't one core, but it was two cores. And so there, this is the hidden core. <coughs> and, that, and, that, um, and the question is, is this plutonium, uh, did it really exist? In this, in this first core, and where is it now? And, that, and that's, the, that's really the, at the heart of <coughs> the whole discrepancy between the IA and North Korea. Oh, let me, oh, actually, let me, this, this is important. And again, I haven't introduced the idea of burn up, but that's, that's a measure of, of how long the fuel's in the reactor. And, um, and it's given as, as an energy unit divided by the amount of, of uranium. So in this case, it's, it's called megawatt thermal days. It's hard to read it here, but per metric ton of uranium or ton of uranium. And it's, and it's, it's um, I don't know what, what you would think would be the distribution of the, of the, of the fuel rods. And this is 8,000. <clears throat> but you can see it's, there's no peak. I mean, you'd sort of think in a reactor that's uniform and, or circular and, 
and um, kind of, it's a cylindrical shape. You'd have more irradiation in the middle and on the edges, that there'd be some kind of, um, well, the distribution wouldn't look like this. And, it, and, um, and it's going from 50, so it's barely irradiated all the way up to here, which is highly irradiated for the, this type of fuel. And, it, and it, there's no real clear pattern. And, it, and, uh, and I won't go into the details, but the, the reactor never really operated very well. And that's actually part of the reason this happened, where you have this, this kind of burn-up distribution.